This is Jim Miller. The following recording is from a set of interviews I did in late November and early December of 2017 with then ESPN president John Skipper. The first was nearly an hour long and took place in his office in Manhattan. The second was conducted via phone, which accounts for the disparity in audio quality. Chapter two of Origins is on ESPN, and episode one was released on December 18th, 2017, just hours before ESPN announced Skipper had resigned. Episode one is titled ESPN and Social Media, A Troubled Marriage, and contains excerpts from our two sessions. What you will hear now is the full interview regarding social media. In January, when episodes two, three, four, and five drop, you will hear more from Skipper, and we will release those full interviews as well. Here is Origins Originals, John Skipper on ESPN and social media. You deal with things that George Bodenheimer, your predecessor, never had to deal with in terms of social media and talent engaging directly with viewers outside of what they're saying on TV. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious about your own learning curve. What has it meant to you to preside over this company at a time when you've had such an unbelievable burgeoning world of social media. It's a complication, right? I would suggest George probably had to deal with some things I don't have to, but in terms of complicating factors in this job, other than the overall sort of disruptive landscape, which includes the sort of disruptive social, both the emergence of big new companies and the emergence of something that people do, right? Which is they tweet and they, they like and they share, has made this more complicated, particularly as regards the talent. And we've been through a couple iterations, right? When it first started happening, people really didn't understand a very amazingly simple thing, which was that it was public. We ended up with some people getting in trouble, and they're sort of like, really? Did did everybody know I said that? It's like, yeah, it's public. But Uh, what about a more basic question, which is that these people come to grips with the fact that they are public figures. That's where I was headed, yeah. which was, look, in the early iteration, people played with it and they did things and they almost didn't know it was public. And then they also didn't understand that they were public. And we had an all hands meeting. I can't remember when it was 2012, uh, 13, pretty shortly into my tenure as president, where we called everybody in and said, look, part of the rules of engagement are this is a public forum. If you tweet something out, it's pretty close to your being on television and giving an interview. And second, and it actually wasn't about tweeting. We actually had somebody who did something inappropriate put pictures of himself on a uh, cell phone. And when he was disciplined for that, he said, that's none of your business. That's me. And it's I'm personal. We established the principle that you are ESPN's so-and-so. And as your employer, we have a right to uh, ask for or even demand certain kinds of behavior. And it's okay if it's legal behavior and it's your right to do, you may do it, but you just may not be working here if you do it. Uh, And I think that's a pretty established principle of the American workplace. And we did that, and that lasted a long time, Jim. And what we have been slow to adapt to, and we're going to have to think through some things, is in the current polarized landscape, the attention paid to comments is very, very high and acute. And the enmity right now between various points of view is so high that these things get blown out of proportion. They also become fodder for other people's content. Right. Right. So, But if John, uh, if John Skipper could somehow go to a lab somehow and, and figure out a way to delete Twitter from the universe, I mean, do you see it as a plus or? No, I wouldn't delete Twitter from the universe. I mean, the, the fact that people can communicate is a good thing and a fun thing. And, you know, I don't want to be the guys in the, in the church who thought the printing press was a bad idea because now people who didn't know what they were doing could actually disseminate information. You know, you're going to have people who abuse things and do dumb things. And we're dealing with sort of a big social issue now, which is how do you deal with mendacity and how do you deal with manipulation? How do you deal with ill intent on these social forums that don't have control? It's very difficult to have controls on which you don't want to curtail what people can do. But what what a lot of people do is, is, uh, is heinous. I mean, you have 
a variety of burners on your stove at any given time that are erupting with rights fees and upcoming negotiations and discussions with conferences and managing all these employees and various things. But it seems that this is one of the more challenging aspects of a job, do you think? Uh, I do think. And by the way, I, I actually, I think I have like the largest industrial stove in the media management business. I, Without a doubt. Like 83 burners or something. And um, this is one of the ones where the temperature goes from off to double high immediately, right? It's like gas. It's not electric. It's, like it's, it's gas, and it flat. And unlike a negotiation, that. it's totally public. Uh, and it's totally public. So all difficult matters to uh, navigate. By now, you've heard many talk of the amazing shave they get from Dollar Shave Club razors, especially when used with their Dr. Carver shave butter. Now, you can add even more DSC products to your daily routine. Dollar Shave Club makes products for your hair, your face, skin, shower, everything you need. They will have you looking and feeling amazing. And it's all their own original stuff. They only use the finest premium ingredients and they deliver to you, just like they do their razors. That means no more annoying trips to the store, cruising up and down aisles, looking at shelf upon shelf of, what the hell is that and what do I do with it? You can use Dollar Shave Club for just about everything. They will have you covered head to toe. And with gift memberships and e-gift cards available, DSC can help cover the names of your holiday shopping list too. We want you to love Dollar Shave Club as much as millions do. So we've arranged for you to try your first month of their best razor, along with travel sized versions of shave butter, body cleanser, and yes, even wipes for just $5. After that, replacement cartridges ship for just a few bucks a month. It's the DSC starter set. Get yours for just five bucks, exclusively at Dollar Shave Club, dot com slash origins that's dollarshaveclub.com slash origins is this even a manageable environment we think so you remember we first released the guidelines in 11 and we were recently trying to remind ourselves why we did so and it was completely a different environment than now we were mostly concerned about people breaking news on Twitter, and we were concerned about people commenting inappropriately about other people and commenting about their colleagues on Twitter. And we found this sort of odd ability by people to somehow think that Twitter was not public, so they would be somewhat surprised when there would be a public to-do about something that had been on. So it was breaking news, it was making inappropriate comments, and we had some people who tweeted inappropriate things. This was the privacy thing. We had an incident where somebody tweeted pictures of themselves uh, and seemed surprised to find out that they were public. Right. So so we instituted the guys on in, in 11, Twitter at that point did not have the kind of toxic environment, the sort of proportional trolling that it has now. So those were not really the issues. And, of course, we probably were a little slow to rethink about them as the overall sort of environment of the country has become more polarized, and we just were slow to respond to that. Do you ever engage yourself in terms of getting on, let's say, Twitter, for example, or Facebook, and just roaming through what the social media universe is saying about the company? I periodically get reports. You know, we do what they refer to now as social listening, which I think means nothing more than kind of monitoring Twitter streams and, and doing analytics over kind of how they break down. I find them marginally useful because I don't think anybody suggests that Twitter is representative. So it's a little bit like going to focus groups. You might learn something, but I don't think it's not a scientific sample. Uh, we certainly look at them around specific issues. But right? when something does happen, we do monitor them. I am mainly always astonished at just how vile and difficult and inappropriate such a high proportion of tweets are. It does seem to have become the home of people who seem to enjoy 
saying inappropriate things about people, the sort of immature exhilaration of being able to use foul language with one of the letters changed and to call people names and to threaten people. I, it, it does expose a sort of fairly astonishing, ugly underbelly of a number of people out there. It seems that ESPN itself has migrated from this place where people thought was so cool and they wanted to be there and people who worked there were so cool to now there's such vitriol and at least on social media ESPN has become quite the target. Do you agree with that? I do think there is an increased level of, I mean, target is an interesting word because it, of course, raises the question of just how manipulative it is, just how sort of doctrinal it is and whether there is some sort of concerted effort there. And, of course, it's just, I think, there is a clearly a correlation between sort of size and influence and and ubiquity and um and a, a tendency then for some sort of disdain on behalf of a sort of group of people acting out and does that alarm you i don't know if it alarms me it it upsets me when i see it no. uh, nobody likes to see it it's interestingly enough one of the discussions we've had recently as we've talked about the social media guidelines is there's been a lot of discussion about just how hard it is no matter how silly you might actually intellectually understand it when you read it i was recently talking to a woman who works at espn and was put into a an assignment which has not been the orthodox assignment for women which it means anytime you get a woman in the booth or and the amount of vitriol that comes out is shocking. By the way, do we pay attention to that? We do not. Are we alarmed by that? Not for any rational reason or business reason. Are we alarmed? Am I alarmed a little bit for reasons about society and culture and who we are? As a citizen, I'm more alarmed about it than I am as a as the president of ESPN. I don't know why we would have such a thick vein of sort of inappropriate, antisocial, misogynistic, homophobic behavior on this medium. And I've continued to think that there ought to be a higher level of of responsibility there for the dissemination of all that content. Yes, it makes one's longs for the uh, Jane Austen days. But um, <laughs> let's move to a different kind of reaction. I was amazed that after... Jamel's saga, uh, particularly when she was suspended, I saw that Al Sharpton was going to be holding a press conference at ABC. And it seems to me, John, that since the day you became president, you have been committed to diversity at ESPN on a level that is unprecedented, I think. And your support, particularly in difficult financial times for the undefeated, has been nonstop. I'm struck by the small margin of error that you had and the network had in the face of having to do some disciplinary action. So Mm -hmm. how did that make you feel that that community, which you've been so supportive of, seemed to turn its back on you? We, as an organization, have been committed to hiring people of color and to supporting women. And uh, we don't have any intention of pulling up from that support. I'm pretty aware that Advocacy organizations do a lot of good in trying to monitor sort of how people are performing relative to what they are most interested in advocating, but they also have some large element of fundraising and self-preservation and a necessity to show whatever its constituency is that they are ever alert and working on their behalf and, uh, they very seldom say, gee, we're upset about this behavior, but would like to note that the organization has long been a good a good advocate of the behavior we'd like to see. It's just, you know, they're highly attuned towards an opportunity to uh, seize the public spotlight, raise some money. So I didn't regard anything like a community turning its back on ESPN. What Jamel did, there were passionate people who wanted to protest that. Uh, We had a lot of support from a lot of people internally. I think a larger examination of the facts would reveal that we are 
overwhelmingly on the right side here and an organization doing significantly more to hire people of color and women and put them in positions of authority and in influence on the air and, and to give them shows. And we spend a lot of time worrying about equal pay for equal work for women. So I think we're on the right side of most of these things. So I'm not going to get particularly disheartened by um, a few vocal critics. Have you noticed that the way in which the network decides to respond to social media issues in terms of whether to punish or not winds up being sometimes a de facto branding of its belief system? I think that people are quick to point out that Simmons was suspended for saying something bad about Roger Goodell, NFL commissioner, but uh, Jamel wasn't for saying something about President Trump. And even though there might be elements within each of those cases which speak differently to why, you know, the response was what it was, it seems that in this day and age now, there's a tendency to kind of attach it to orthodoxies, particularly when ESPN is concerned. There is. And look, many of those kinds of protests are not much attuned to nuance, right? Because uh, if part of the appropriate desire there is to create branding for its own self and for its own standing relative to the advocacy of something, simple matters, which can be somewhat portrayed simply, are better at doing that than nuanced matters. So I, I sort of understand the nature of it, and I'm not I'm not that cynical about it. But so you have to keep a, that in mind when you're forging a response? We do, and we also frequently understand that we need to reach out and talk to people who are questioning what we're doing, make sure they do understand the larger picture, which they usually won't understand in a private conversation. In public, there's a lot of interest in in making sure that they're identified as an organization which is uh, serving its constituency and its community. And again, I'm not... I'm not cynical about it, but to your point, I'm attuned to how we have to respond, and that's both publicly and it is also privately. I'm sitting here with Bob, my producer, and Chris, the Kings 13 bigwig here, and uh, you guys have parachute stuff? Oh, I have it. It's amazing. What do you, you have the sheets, the towels, and all that stuff? Oh, I got the Venice sheets and the towels. It's sent to you. He knows the no model names. names and everything. Holy he's cow. Go, he's going deep. So here's the thing. Did you guys see this thing on YouTube? There was an admiral. His name was uh, McRaven. He yes. was giving this speech, and it went viral because he said that the most important thing to do every day is you wake up and you make your bed. And then I had heard that Michelle Obama, when the Obamas moved into the White House, one of the first things she said to her daughters is, look, you may be living in the White House, but you're still going to be making your bed. <laughs> and so I thought about that because when I got the parachute comforter, I was running out one day, and I do make my bed every morning, but I kind of like just pulled it up, straightened it out, and just ran. And then I looked back, and like it looked like I had spent 10 minutes making the bed. Have you encountered that? I don't make my bed as often as I should, uh -huh. but it looks good when I do. I think Bob made his bed about a year ago, but it would probably <laughs> work out really well. I'm telling if this is a, uh, a self-making bed, I'm all for it. It actually doesn't <laughs> roll back by itself like a <laughs> pool cover. But um, what's the deal with the towels? Because I haven't tried the towels yet. They're just so soft. They just feel yeah. great on like when you come out of the shower. Wait a minute. Were those the ones when we went camping that you brought? Yeah. yeah. Actually, he brought those things camping, and those things were amazing. We all went camping one time, and he brought those, and they were unbelievable. Okay, I just think that they look too nice to be on camping. But well, maybe... I, yeah, but it was nice. I mean, I, we had well, something to use. Look at, look at Bob bringing parachute towels. Um, <laughs> well, listen, here's the good news. They're so sure that you'll love their sheets that they offer basically a 60-night trial. So if you don't love them, you just send them back, no questions asked, after 60 nights. And they even donate bedding for Habitat for Humanity, which... Oh, that's cool. You know, that's very sounds cool. like a pretty cool idea. Wow. So visit ParachuteHome.com slash Origins now for free shipping and returns on Parachute's amazing bedding. I got to go to this thing because I'm telling you, my sheets are subpar and these things sound amazing. All right. So don't forget, ParachuteHome.com slash Origins. I follow a lot of people at ESPN on mm -hmm. social media, and I am aware just by conversations with them that there is a ideological mix. But do you believe that ESPN is an inherently liberal institution or a place where the majority of its employees are liberal and are, more importantly, manifesting that in their work? We're not inherently a liberal organization because the organization itself doesn't 
call for any particular orthodoxy. Uh, we're not trying to get engaged in political issues. We we make no apologies about being a progressive organization that cares about inclusion and diversity. And there are people who regard some of our those positions, which we hold to be positions that allow people to be who they are. Some people inherently regard those as liberal, and it's just not the way we view the world. We don't think tolerance is is a, a domain of the right or the left or the conservative or the liberal. As to our the makeup of our population, I think that uh, uh, we exist primarily as an executive group in New York City and Los Angeles and Bristol, certainly in New York City and Los Angeles. There's a large proportion of the population that tends to be more liberal than the rest of the country. That's urban areas in general. We also tend to have a very, very overwhelmingly well-educated population, which also tends to be somewhat more uh, liberal. So we do have to think about where we are and what that means relative to what most of the people at our company in those locations thinks. Though we are grounded in Bristol, Connecticut, I did look at the election results in Bristol, Connecticut, and um, the town of Bristol, Connecticut voted for Donald Trump. So there is very little doubt that we have many employees in Bristol uh, who are, by the nature of being in a, a smaller town, a more outlying area, a place with largely working class roots that it does sort of ground us and I think it does create something I have to be mindful of which is a little bit of uh, a broad set of beliefs with our company which may be somewhat different in Bristol, Connecticut than they are in New York and Los Angeles and we're in Austin, Texas and we're in Charlotte, North Carolina and we're in Miami, Florida so that's one reason we have to be respectful of people's beliefs and why I'm not sure that I believe that there is a sort of predominant orthodoxy at the company, either institutionally or relative to our population. Great. Last question. Uh, there's an obvious duality to the journey that you've been taking as president of ESPN, the professional and the personal. And mm -hmm. I was struck by the fact that I had people calling me after the Jamel incident about Trump. And they had never seen you so upset. And it just seemed like since you became president, I don't think uh, I've heard people talk about you being either so mad or, or looking so stricken or upset. And just on a personal level, John, what is it like for you to have to go through some of these things? I know you're a big boy and they pay you a lot of money for this. But could you just talk about the personal side of it? I um, generally have had the ability to remain calm. And I must confess that there's been a significant amount of stress and dealing with situations where it's very difficult to parse what the right thing to do is in a very complicated environment is frustrating. And I have let that get the better of me a few times. I'm trying not to anymore because I'm trying to keep the greater picture in mind. And, of course, I have a great deal of affection for this company and for the people who work here. And in some instances, I, I feel a bit like I've let them down. And so I think that probably is um, the result of that. And my intention going forward is to try to stick to who we are as a company, what our values are, and to try to stick to who we are as an organization and, and rely upon remembering as a journalistic organization and try to, to under pin those values and decisions I make, but I wouldn't tell you that it clearly is an environment that is harder to navigate than it has been in the past, and uh, certainly where it's hard to control your emotions is where things feel out of your control, right, where you feel like you tried to make the right decisions, you try to set the right policies in place, and you can only control so much, and I do think sometimes people forget how big ESPN is and how much content we produce and how many people we have, and at this point, the level of scrutiny we have, which doesn't really leave much margin for error. So I think there was sort of a, a perfect storm of frustration for about a four or five, six week period where we had a, a several things happen that were frustrating, and I think I've probably, those things piled up on each other. And uh, I hope I've learned a good lesson in how to 
you know, try to remain calm in the face of difficult things, but everybody's human and sometimes it gets the better of you. And if I've shown some of that in the workplace, uh, I regret it, and I'm I'm trying to to avoid that. Though I do believe sometimes people like to see a little passion. Again, it's all complicated, Jim. It just is. You know, I don't actually know what three dimensional chess means exactly. Uh, I mean, I think I know what it is literally, but it's actually more interesting as a non literal description of complexity. And it does just feel like we're in an astonishingly complex environment where there are very few places where you don't end up having some difficult surprises, what I regard as unfair scrutiny. I don't mind fair scrutiny. We have an ombudsman we or person, we, um, and uh, we don't mind. We're self-critical internally. What I don't like are sort of the, the gotcha critics and the, you know, the critics who specialize in distorting information and and who have a narrative they want to tell about our company. And when we sort of have a a self-inflicted wound where we walk into a little of that, uh, I think that's what makes me the most irritable. Well, I I spoke with George Bodenheimer for 45 minutes the other day, and uh, boy, there's a man with a lot of great timing and a lot of uh, a low blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, no, George, uh, I still contend that his accomplishment was underestimated because he pulled all the right levers and uh, made the right decisions, and it just gets underestimated. By the way, he could care less. I often say that he gave you the cement to build the big moat. Uh, he did. He did. I loved working for George, and uh, again, he's a superior leader. John Skipper resigned as president of ESPN on December 18th, 2017, and was replaced temporarily by his predecessor, George Bodenheimer. For Origins, Chapter 2, ESPN, this is Jim Miller. Thanks, as always, to Chris Basil, Chris Cochran, Bob Tabador, and the entire Cadence 13 gang. Wishing all of you a healthy and joyous 2018. Cheers. Cheers.